It's ABC News special marking 40 years of HIV and AIDS. I'm Madeline Morris in Melbourne. And I'm Jeremy Fernandez in Sydney. Coming up, an exclusive interview with Dr Anthony Fauci looking back at the dark early days. I knew we were dealing with a new infection and I was healing nobody. They were all suffering and dying. We hear about the medical breakthroughs that have saved millions of lives around the world. When we don't have a cure and we don't have a, a vaccine, we have a range of prevention tools, treatment tools. No one should get newly infected, no one should die. And we sit down with a veteran survivor of the early days of the Australian epidemic. What hasn't changed is that stigma. It's pervasive and occurs in different forms. December the 1st is World AIDS Day, and in this year of such a big anniversary, when the world is so focused on the COVID pandemic, it's a really opportune time to look at where we are with HIV and also, Jez, the many parallels between the COVID pandemic and the AIDS pandemic. Madeline, in medical terms, what scientists have managed to do in treating HIV over the last 40 years is nothing short of extraordinary. But at the same time, there's a lot of stigma around and visibility that hasn't changed. There's still a lot to learn from the world's experience with HIV AIDS and how we get through the COVID pandemic. So let's take a look at where we are with HIV now. Since the HIV pandemic began, 77 and a half million people have contracted the virus and nearly half of them, 35 million people, have died. That is nearly seven times the official numbers of global deaths from COVID. And last year alone, it took nearly 700 thousand lives. So Jez, although globally the picture is still very difficult, in Australia we've actually been doing pretty well. We have indeed. It really is a picture of two worlds though. For people in countries like Australia, a wealthy country with resources and know-how, we've got access to treatments like PEP and PrEP, pre and post exposure prophylaxis, and also antiretrovirals for those who have HIV. And that means case numbers here are falling year on year. That's a great thing. And today, people living with HIV have a chance at a long and healthy life. But in poorer countries, particularly those in sub-Saharan Africa and those as close by as PNG, the numbers are still heading in the wrong direction. Case numbers are climbing and treatment options are sparse. And Jeremy, Today, right now, there is an exciting development in the prospect for a potential AIDS vaccine. Madeline, this is one of those holy grails of medical science that scientists around the world have been trying to find since those earliest reported cases 40 years ago. The search has continued ever since. Here's Mark Feinberg, the CEO of the International AIDS Vaccine Alliance. His organisation is one of the co-sponsors with Moderna of the mRNA vaccine trial for HIV, which is about to begin phase one human trials. HIV is by far the most challenging target we've ever sought to develop a vaccine against. And so it's requiring new approaches, new technologies. I think it's going to be some time. You know, I think a lot of people imagine, you know, just because we're using RNA technologies that were so successful in expediting COVID vaccine development that we can expect that we'll have an HIV vaccine within a year or two, but that's clearly not going to be the case. I think it'll be significantly longer than that. And I think if one were to say a decade from now, I think I would love to see that be the case, but that may well be optimistic. So we're looking at a vaccine potentially about 10 years away. But the important thing to remember is that a lot of the work on HIV is a big reason why we're so well placed now to deal with COVID-19, Madeline. It sure is. And we'll be diving into that more as the program progresses. Thanks, Jeremy. So that is the situation as it currently stands. But it certainly has been a very long four decades for the tens of millions of people affected by the AIDS pandemic. Let's look back now at how we got here. It was in July 1981 when doctors in the United States first noticed a strange phenomenon. Previously healthy young gay men were arriving at hospital very sick and with unusual symptoms. And what we saw were diseases that we really had never seen before in that age group. A variety of infections, a variety of cancers. And really almost immediately we knew that there was a new disease in our midst. 
young gay men were coming down with a disease that nobody knew anything about, nobody knew what caused it. So there was a lot of fear, a lot of misinformation, and not a lot of accurate description of what was going on. Authorities first thought this new condition only targeted the gay population, but it soon began affecting other groups, women, drug users, and haemophiliacs. Scientists gave it a name, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. A special report in a recent edition of the American magazine Newsweek described AIDS as a new and deadly disease coursing through the country. I have definitely been a victim of discrimination. I was fired from my job. I have been refused housing. Uh, uh, some medical care has been refused. As stigma and fear took hold, AIDS spread around the world, including to Australia. No one knows what causes it or how to cure it, and now it's here. The Sydney case was identified by a doctor at St Vincent's Hospital in Darlinghurst. It accelerated very rapidly after that. Bill Botel was Chief of Staff to the Federal Health Minister at the time. They were presenting right at the extreme end when they were very sick and, and nothing much could be done for them. And this started to accelerate rapidly in 83. It wasn't until 1984 that scientists discovered AIDS was caused by a virus. One of the earliest investigators was a young Dr. Anthony Fauci. We don't know a lot about AIDS, but we also know an incredible amount about it. By 1987, still with no effective treatment, the Australian government rolled out the successful but controversial Grim Reaper ad. Now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. We had no cure, we had no effective treatment. Behaviour change was the key to stopping it being transmitted. The ad helped slow the spread of the virus, but some in the gay community say it caused more harm than good. It wasn't until later that year that the first treatment drug, AZT, was approved after protests from activists demanding its testing be fast-tracked. Many were arrested for taking part in the demonstrations and access to the drug remained a problem as did AZT's strong side effects. Meantime, AIDS was becoming a major health problem throughout the developing world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. At this Johannesburg hospital in Hillbrow, it's estimated that between 20 and 30% of all patients admitted for treatment are HIV positive. But as infections grew globally into the millions, highly effective antiretroviral drugs were developed. The problem, they cost tens of thousands of dollars a year. Again, activists forced the hand of the establishment. Eventually, drug companies shared the patents and across the developing world, millions began to receive life-saving treatment. Antiretroviral drugs don't just keep people with HIV healthy, they're now also deployed to stop people getting the virus in the first place. PrEP is considered to be about 99% effective in, in reducing HIV transmission. Since PrEP, as it's known, was put on the Australian Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme in 2018, it's been widely taken up by the gay community and the number of new infections has nearly halved. Four decades of work, passion, loss and love from dedicated activists, clinicians and scientists has seen immense changes in the HIV pandemic. But the search for the ultimate goals, a vaccine and a cure, still remain. Well, one of the most familiar faces in that look back at the history is that of Anthony Fauci. And we, of course, know him as the man leading the United States health and scientific response to COVID. But for 40 years, he has also been at the vanguard of their response to HIV. And he joined me earlier from the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C. Hello, how are you? Good to be with you. It's fantastic to have you on our special program. Can you take us back 40 years? You saw a medical alert that five young, previously healthy gay men had all developed a rare form of pneumonia. What went through your mind then? I thought that would be a one-off. 
But then one month later, in July of 1981, another MMWR came out, this time 23 gay men, curiously all gay, not only from Los Angeles, but from New York City and San Francisco. The same thing, pneumocystis, other opportunistic infections, and a rare tumor seen in people whose immune response was compromised called Kaposi sarcoma. At that very point, I literally was just was dumbfounded because I knew we were dealing with a new infection. And I made a decision at that point in the summer of 1981 that I would change the direction of my career to study what I knew was a brand new disease that had to be an infection, even though we didn't know what it was. And what was it like in those early days, so many young people dying and for so long, just no viable treatment? Well, I refer to it uh, very correctly and sadly as the darkest phase of my medical career and even my life because it transformed my very life. I did nothing 24 seven, but do two things, try and take care of these desperately ill, mostly young men. At the same time as trying to do some form of research to understand the disease. It was, it was really terrible. Uh, it, I still must say without any hyperbole or drama that I still have a bit of a post-traumatic stress from that because I went from the previous eight or nine years seeing patients and developing relative cures for other diseases such as inflammatory vascular diseases that I was very successful in turning around and inducing remission. I went from a pure success to virtually all of my patients dying. So I looked back on it and said I was trained to be a healer as a physician, and I was healing nobody. They were all suffering and dying. And that's the reason why a few years later, when the virus was discovered and we began to really understand it and ultimately develop drugs to do something about it, it was a total transformation from completely dark years of nothing but people dying and suffering to being able to do something about it with highly effective drugs. Well, what some people may not know about you, Dr. Fauci, is uh, we will have, people will be very familiar with the criticism that you received from some quarters in the US over the last 18 months. But at the start of the AIDS pandemic as well, you also got a lot of criticism from AIDS activists who said you weren't doing enough to get drugs out. The regulatory system did not really address itself to a disease that was killing so many young men because it went through a process that took a lot of time to make decisions. So the gay community wanted to be heard. So they became very iconoclastic, disruptive, and theatrical. And I became a target, understandably. And it turned out when you listened to what they were saying, they were absolutely correct. And I made a decision that if I were in their shoes, I'd be doing the same type of activism and demonstration. That's completely different than what we're seeing now in the United States and in maybe places throughout the world where the pushback is not pro-science, which the AIDS activists were. The pushback is anti-science. And we have a degree of divisiveness in my country that is totally counterproductive to an adequate and proper response to a global pandemic and an epidemic in our country that has already killed over 770,000 people. To the science, the breakthroughs in science in terms of treating and also vaccines for COVID have been phenomenal, yet we're still waiting for a cure, we're still waiting for a vaccine for HIV. There are some great treatments, but we're still waiting why is that and how frustrating is that to you? Well, there's frustration with regard to vaccine because HIV is a very, very unusual virus that makes developing a vaccine extremely difficult right now and maybe impossible. The role of science 
in developing therapies for HIV, I think stands out as one of the greatest medical advances of our era, where we've taken a disease that was essentially uniformly fatal. And right now, if you put people on the proper combination of drugs, which you can give with one pill, you can essentially allow them to lead almost a normal life. That is an extraordinary scientific advance. The UN says it wants to see an end to HIV and AIDS by 2030. Is that achievable? I believe it is. I don't think we're going to eliminate it, and I don't think we're going to eradicate it. But I think by 2030 that we could get it out of the pandemic phase and bring a level of control to it that is not nearly at the level of infections that we're seeing now throughout the world. Dr. Anthony Fauci there. Well, as we've heard, things have changed substantially in the 40 years since the emergence of HIV AIDS. I caught up with two men living with the virus to find out how recent diagnosis compares with the scenario decades ago. Hello. 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 Hey, everyone. Good, Good. Good. Hey. Good. Thanks yourself. Good to see you. Great. Good to see you. Yeah. Nice John. to see you again. Yeah. yeah. You. So great to chat with both of you about this. John, tell me what it was like when you first got diagnosed with HIV. Yes, Jeremy, I was diagnosed before the age of protease inhibitors. So protease inhibitors are the antiretroviral therapies that we are able to take now. Um, they became available in 1996, 1997. I was diagnosed prior to that. So when I was diagnosed with HIV, the prognosis was uncertain. We didn't have the treatments that we have now. How did you feel about that at the time? Um, pretty devastated, uh, Jeremy, and I think that's a common experience for people living with HIV. Absolutely, uh, and you're absolutely right, John. We, we, we share the same virus and we also share many um, things that I guess affect us once, we're, when, once we've been diagnosed. The, the, the trauma, the stigma, the shame. So we all know HIV affects everyone. It's not just a gay or men who have sex with men problem. And I think the gay community, we've sort of empowered ourselves. We know that we have PEP and PrEP and we have a lot of great resources. We're educated. We're, we actually, we have the most tools and the most educated we've ever been. But then you look at the other communities that it affect, the, the mm. Cal communities, migrant mm. communities, international student communities. Um, some of them may have cultural or religious constraints to um, not just getting educated, but to, to staying socially connected and to disclosing their statuses. So it's very different for every community. Yeah, and I think the stigma can occur in different contexts. For example, there is research at the moment being done by the Centre for Social Research and Health in the University of New South Wales on stigma. And they've developed a series of indicators to assess whether people are experiencing stigma and it's still being experienced in healthcare settings. It strikes me that you've had some very similar experiences between the two of you in the space of a generation, but also some big differences. I mean, Ruban, you must sort of reflect on how many people have gone before, the people who died, the people who went through those experimental treatments to get to the point that you are at now where you can disclose and yep. talk about it openly. Absolutely. I think about it every day when I have my pill. I won't be here today popping one pill, pretending nothing's happened if it wasn't for, you know, the long-term survivors, the first people of the movement, the, the, the people who became HIV positive in the 80s, they put their bodies on the line. So I'm absolutely aware of the privilege. And I guess that's part of why I'm willing to stand up and talk about it. I think it's my genera generational due to pay. Um, I've got to make it easier for the next generation. They've made it so easy for me. This is it's my job. It's, it's my duty. Yeah, I, I, I too have some sense of responsibility. So there were this incredible group of people who did all this hard work. Many of them have not survived. And I think like you, Rowan, I feel a sense of responsibility to uh, continue to tell that story. One thing I have to say is people living with HIV, especially the long-term survivors face uh, epic levels of, of iso social isolation. I think for the most part, people who become positive today, once they're educated and they, and they know that they can, they can do anything they've always wanted to do, they don't have to sacrifice any of their dreams. HIV is now easier to manage than um, living with diabetes. One of the greatest fears is of transmitting HIV to another person. Now we know that we can avoid that by, uh, with the current treatments. And I think that is an enormous change from where we were 40 years ago. Guys, thank you so much. Really good to talk to you, Thanks for having Thanks, us. Thanks, Jeremy.
Winnie Bianima is leading the United Nations efforts to end the AIDS epidemic by the end of this decade as the executive director of UN AIDS. She joined me earlier from Geneva and told me how COVID has disrupted efforts to eradicate AIDS. We saw the numbers of people coming forward for testing decreasing, the number of people picking up prevention tools such as condoms and PrEP decreasing. We saw fewer, less people coming to pick up their treatment, they were afraid of coming to clinics. So services were disrupted and this has had an impact and we'll see the results perhaps in new infections and more deaths in the years to come. UNAIDS has recently adopted a new global strategy aimed at ending AIDS as a public health threat by the year 2030. It's had input from 10,000 stakeholders, 160 different countries, and it's built around addressing inequality. Why is that the centerpiece of this strategy? We know that the targets that we are set for 2020, which the world didn't reach, could have been reached. They were not a fantasy or just aspirational. They were realistic targets. Why? Because countries that are so different, such as Swaziland, poor, landlocked, small country with a high burden of HIV, was able to reach our treatment targets. But that is also the same as Switzerland, very rich country where I'm sitting now. If Swaziland and Switzerland could achieve them, so could all the countries in between. So we know they are achievable, but the reason they are not achieved is that those who don't come forward, who don't get prevention tools, who don't get tested, who don't get treated, are not able to do so because they experience inequalities. So it is those inequalities we must re remove. There are inequalities in the enjoyment of human rights. What response do you get from governments and pharmaceutical companies when you call on them to have a bigger role in fighting HIV in lower income countries? There is greed. There's corporate greed that has become so sanitized and we accept it as good business, but actually it's just corporate greed. And when you've made your first billion and you made a hundred billion and you make a thousand billion, what's the difference? What's it going to do for you? So we need to get some economic sense and we need to get governments to put that economic sense in, in reality by bringing their companies to the table and asking them to share the technology so that there, there are multiple companies producing this. Every region can produce this if we have the recipes for every region. There's a problem in wealthier countries, including Australia, where Indigenous people are left behind. They have lower rates of diagnosis, treatment and survival from HIV and AIDS. Why is that? In Australia, the rate of diagnosis has been between 1.3 and 1.9 times higher among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people than Australian born non-Indigenous people. So you see it's higher. And these factors of race, of sexuality, sexual orientation, even of illiteracy, education, unequal education standards, economic inequality all come together and we design solutions based on understanding those inequalities and reducing them. How do you see the 2030 goal playing out in Africa where HIV is still a major public health threat? It seems that it's easier for some countries and not so easy for others. The epicenter of the epidemic is in Eastern Southern Africa. That's where I come from too. But this region over the last 20 years has been reducing infections, reducing deaths. The direction of travel is in the right direction. But in Western Central Africa, it's the opposite. We are seeing actually an epidemic starting at a low level, but rising, moving in the wrong direction. Last year alone, 150,000 AIDS-related deaths were in that region, 
200,000 people became newly infected. And of those new infections, almost three quarters of the young people are young women and adolescent girls. And it's rising. Put the money where your issue is. That way we can solve it. Winnie Bianuma, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Winnie Bianuma from UNAIDS there. Well, so far we've heard about vaccines and what is needed to prevent transmission in the first place. What about the other ultimate aim? a cure. Well, Australia is one of the world leaders in the hunt for a cure and with the Melbourne HIV Cure Consortium ran out of the Doherty Institute here. I went along to the Doherty to check out one of their labs and to meet a young researcher who has a very personal interest in finding a cure for HIV. Welcome Madeline to our HIV lab here in the Doherty Institute. We're uh, really focused here at the moment on a cure for HIV and the need for a cure for HIV is despite after 40 years of discovering HIV and AIDS, we've made significant uh, revolutions in terms of treatment so that people living with HIV can live long and healthy lives. However, we can't cure it because the virus is really able to hide inside of cells for a very long period of time. And if it's hiding inside the cell, then the immune system can't recognize that cell and can't get rid of it. And that means that if somebody stops taking therapy, then suddenly the virus comes back again and then that's when we start having issues. So really what we try to do is we try to purge those cells and we try to reawaken that virus in what's called a shock and cure. So you need to wake it up when it is latent in someone's body yeah, exactly. in order to kill it. Yes, definitely. So as it, the idea is that if we can reactivate that virus, if we can wake that virus up, then suddenly our immune system can start doing its job. It can start realizing, hey, there's a virus in there. Let's get rid of that cell. And this is of particular relevance to you personally. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm also living with HIV as well. And it's really important for us to be able to involve people living with HIV at all aspects of research. It's something that we really try to try to drive home in the sense of, you know, nothing about us without us. And what does it mean to you personally, uh, as a person living with HIV, to be involved in this incredibly important work? Yeah, it's really great and it's really rewarding for me and it also means that I can, I can come in with my own lived experience and help to understand the nuances of HIV because it is such a complex virus, both scientifically and socially as well. And we really need to understand all of those aspects in order to have a complete picture of what the virus is doing. We're certainly around the corner with the cure. We've seen a few cases of individuals who have been able to be cured. And I think now the question is really about how can we scale up a cure for everybody? Because that's really what we need in terms of being able to uh, combat the HIV AIDS epidemic. So a pretty hopeful note being struck there. Let's bring in our expert panel to discuss it further. I'm joined in the studio by Sharon Lewin, the Director and Infectious Diseases Expert at the Doherty Institute. Christabel Miller, who lives with HIV and is past president of Living Positive Victoria. And in Sydney, we've got Daryl O'Donnell, who's the CEO of the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations. Thank you all very much for coming in. So much to discuss with where we are in HIV and, and what the future holds. Sharon, I'd just like to go and continue this discussion about a cure. Uh, a very hopeful note being struck there by Jared. And really, we have even more hope now with a new case called the Esperanza patient. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. The Esperanza patient's a young woman who lives in Esperanza in Argentina, and she is what we call an elite controller, meaning about 1% of people living with HIV are able to naturally control their viral infection. We've known about people like that for a very long time. But what's unique about the Esperanza patient was that when the team of researchers looked hard for her virus, they were only able to find fragments of virus and not a complete sequence of a virus raising the possibility that she's cured herself of infection. She was definitely infected, um, but she seems to have cured herself of infection by getting rid of intact virus. And that is very exciting because very few people are able to do this around the world. And where are we, more broadly speaking, do you think, with this quest for a cure in HIV? Well, for the past 10 years, there's been many scientists around the world working on this. We have a few examples of cure that have occurred in the community for different reasons. 
There's a lot of work going on in animal models that looks promising. And I think what gives me hope is the level of investment that we're seeing, which is significant, the number of scientists working on the problem. And as we've seen with HIV over the last 40 years, we can achieve incredible things when you bring a lot of great minds to it. Will we have a cure in the next 10 years? It's impossible to know. And in the meantime, particularly in Australia, we're focused on ending transmission. And, and Daryl, your organisation has put forward an agenda and you reckon that we could actually end transmission effectively in Australia by 2025. How would that happen? Well, that's right. And uh, we've now got all of the tools we need. We've got uh, uh, excellent uh, prevention options. We've got the tests we need and we've got a uh, very, very effective treatment to keep people with HIV well. So uh, those tools are available. We do have the option to bring those together uh, to end transmission. What we don't yet have is the level of investment needed. Uh, and that investment is needed to really get the message to communities, to people who might be able to benefit from those tools um, and to pa scale up those efforts uh, uh, so that we've got uh, everyone having access to the testing and the treatment that's going to keep them well, uh, to get them diagnosed and to, to keep them well and to prevent ongoing transmission. We, we do have really, as I said, tremendous success in Australia. We've got fewer than a thousand transmissions a year, which is just such an achievement, especially considering where we've uh, come from looking back over the last 40 years or so. But, but Christabel, to you, there are still some significant pockets of uh, people in Australia where it's just not as well covered in terms of, mm. of the care and the prevention. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um... Uh, before I answer that though, I think what I must say is that it is okay to be HIV positive. It is okay. You still belong, you still matter, and there is certainly a beautiful community waiting there for you when you are ready. Um, but to your question, yes, absolutely. I mean, fewer than a thousand, but 900 is still 900 too many. And um, it's plain to see I'm, I'm white, I'm cisgender, I'm queer, but I can mask that quite easily. However, I still experienced extreme barriers to accessing care. Um, I had to ask, I had to request uh, for an HIV test, despite what I now know presenting in front of my medical professionals for about a year, clearly exhibiting the signs of HIV and AIDS. And unfortunately, I was in a state of AIDS by the time I was diagnosed and very nearly not with us anymore. So if I experience those issues with somebody who experiences a lot of privilege, what can we imagine it is imperative we think about uh, women of colour, people who have English as a second language, who cannot advocate for themselves in these settings, uh, individuals who are Medicare ineligible, Aboriginal people who are the traditional owners of the land, sovereignty was never ceded, uh, transgender, gender non-binary people, if these people these are marginalised people with an already marginalised demographic. That is what today, what a programme like today is about, bringing attention to them and focusing our efforts on those groups. And more widely, the number of people who, the majority of people who actually who get HIV mm. in the world these days are uh, younger women of colour. Absolutely. Yeah. And Sharon, how much, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, Sharon, how much has COVID um, taken the focus away from HIV? What's the, what's the intersection there? Look, COVID's a major crisis for the world and we live in a world of limited resources, so there has definitely been significant impacts on the HIV response. First of all, we know that 10% less people are accessing prevention services globally. So there's fewer people getting tested or accessing the prevention services that Daryl mentioned, such as PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. In many communities, we didn't experience in Australia, but globally there's challenges just to continue accessing your treatment. And of course, the research sector have been diverted. In many ways, it's a good thing. You know, there has been so much expertise from HIV that has been translated into the COVID response. And I, as an HIV scientist, feel really proud of that. But research in HIV would invariably have slowed down. In Australia, as an example, most clinical research for trials of new treatments for HIV, for cure interventions, that largely stopped. So COVID has had and will continue to have 
a big impact on the HIV response. All of the decades of research that has gone into HIV has actually been very beneficial to the COVID response, particularly yeah. for vaccines. Yes, in, in many ways, not only the technologies, so mRNA, for example, work on mRNA started 20 years ago with a brilliant idea of delivering a new vaccine, but was subsequently developed and tested in other viruses, including HIV. Uh, the way we currently have antibodies that are used for treatment of COVID, that technology came about because of the decades of investment in antibodies for HIV. A whole understanding of how we use antivirals to treat and prevent viral infection has been fine-tuned with HIV. Many of the diagnostic tests that are being used for COVID largely come from investments in HIV. So it's been a pretty extraordinarily good example of when you invest in science and when you tackle a, you know, a very significant problem, there are payoffs for that for many, many years to come and in other areas as well. So that's the science. Daryl, um, grassroots organisations like the, the ones that come under your umbrella, they were so influential in Australia and around the world in getting access to treatment and mm. equitable access. Um, it was a really grassroots campaign. When you look at the two pandemics, how do you compare the two in terms of the social response? Uh, there's, there's a lot that, uh, there, there's a feeling of deja vu for many of us who've uh, worked in the HIV area for a long time. Um, some very basic principles that have uh, held us uh, in good stead on HIV, things such as uh, uh, putting the last mile first. Uh, which is really about, uh, we know that some people are going to be left behind, uh, whether it's on HIV or on COVID. Uh, and so putting the efforts in, front-loading those efforts to actually look after those who um, are at risk of not benefiting uh, is so important, whether we're talking about HIV or whether we're talking about COVID. Uh, but the other very important parallel is uh, uh, is thinking about the world as it is. Uh, in HIV, we've really attended to the real world uh, lived experience of those who are at risk and uh, and those who are living with HIV, and that's vital. It takes us away from uh, the abstract ideas of people as they should be uh, to people um, as they live their lives. And I think during COVID, um, you know, we've we've become very conscious that not everyone uh, lives in a house with a a spare room and a study that some people are living in mm -hmm. uh, crowded conditions. Uh, we've become aware that uh, not everyone has the privilege of just working one job. Some people are working multiple jobs. Uh, and those things have, uh, have come to attention uh, through COVID, sometimes too late. Um, but the lessons are there and, uh, and I think we have uh, improved as the uh, progress of the response has, uh, has proceeded that uh, we've become more attentive to those. Uh, but COVID isn't going anywhere and we really need to pick up those lessons and take them into the future. And Christabel, as a person who lives with HIV, what's it been like living through a second pandemic? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's an almost impossible question to answer, to be honest. Uh, firstly, I'm, I must pay tribute, as Daryl mentioned, to those who lived through the 80s and early 90s who lost their, their loved ones to HIV. I cannot imagine what existing through a pandemic on this scale has been like for them. However, um, it has been extremely um, traumatizing to have your private, what is often has been extremely stigmatized words like viral load, um, testing positive, come out of the mouths of your co-workers, the news anchor. It's, it, it's extremely confronting. But I think what my community really feels is that we wish um, you would sort of let us show you the way. Uh, we know how to survive and to thrive in the face of a virus that does not discriminate. It doesn't have a moral compass, despite however anybody may imply to you. 40 years on, do, do, is HIV now a story of hope? Yes, I do think. I think HIV is a story of um, the power of community. Uh, the power of partnerships, um, how science can work with leadership and community to achieve great things. And although we're still living with HIV and, and um, 37 million people around the world and 1.5 million new infections every year and still 650,000 deaths every year, the progress has been extraordinary. Uh, and we heard earlier that a vaccine could still be 10 years away. You say a cure could st still be 10 years away the science needed to find a vaccine and find a cure are 
is infinitely more complex, I think, than for COVID. So we've still got a long road. Um, but I think the history of HIV has shown that we don't give up and we can challenge, we can meet the challenge of these, what seems incredible problems and, and overcome them. And that's the message of hope. Well, Sharon, Daryl and Christabel, thank you so much. And um, it's been fantastic to speak to you. And Jeremy, uh, we really are leaving there with a message of still many challenges to go, but incredible resilience and incredible work that has happened over the last four decades. Madeline, the advances of the past 40 years mean there is a lot of hope for the future. If we've come this far, what medical marvels could the next 40 years hold? A cure isn't necessarily imminent, but this anniversary is a reminder of how critical that scientific work is in sustaining the call to action on HIV AIDS and all infectious diseases. Jeremy, it certainly is. HIV is as much a story of solidarity and community as it is of the tragedy and difficulty of the last 40 years. So we'll leave this special ABC News program with cabaret performer Mama Alto performing Stand By You.